it. So anybody who's popping in now or for people viewing this video, I tried to start the live stream and there was uh, there was audio of the live stream playing. I must have accidentally opened up the stream in the YouTube app. I do not like the app at all. Anyways, I have it specifically so that I can live stream like this. So anyways, so we're gonna we're gonna get right into things here. I just wanted to fix the feedback issue. This is probably gonna be very confusing. Also seeing that there's nobody here right now uh, because I had to end the stream and then restart it. So hopefully people will find their way over to here. Hopefully, we'll see. So anyways, but you know, since this is gonna be going up as a dead stream, I might as well, uh, I might as well just keep going because uh, again, we have the, we have the uh, auction follow-up finisher tonight, so I have to get ready for some stuff for that, and that's probably gonna be several hours. I still have to finish inventorying the office, actually. So, but anyways, uh, again, for people who are who already were here, and for future posterity, uh, gonna have to take a roundabout way to go to uh, the rest of the front yard because these things got delivered and so my path is blocked by obstacles but so it's october and you wouldn't expect there to be a lot going on out here and i actually kind of didn't expect there to be a lot going on for us to see in, in terms of you know you can see all the dead stems from stuff but things that are actually still blooming and sort of insect activity it'll keep going until we get a hard frost and even sometimes a bit after that so there's a lot of color here we're gonna go go on over this way and get through here and this is something I I want to touch on these were in fuller bloom a couple of well up until a couple days ago it's also been kind of dry so a lot of things don't look as good as they usually do but this is Biden's Aristosa it's a uh, species of tick seed I I really like it because you know you get a lot of you get get this good yellow color at a time of year when we're really sort of lacking uh, for color. And obviously, as I said, it's going out of bloom now, or perhaps rather the, it's actually finished getting pollinated. So this is, it's one of those things I really look forward to. All, all through the uh, summer, you know, it just looks very weedy growing up uh, wherever it is. And then all of a sudden you get a nice little pop of color, just sort of looking over here sunflowers which uh, I think have been pushed out of the way by somebody trying to deliver stuff to my house understandable uh, more sunflowers annuus will just keep going helianthus annuus will just keep going uh, to frost uh, barely even get stopped by that basically and then we have here's another one that that brings a lot and has a pretty long bloom time this is uh, white snake root and again I think this is one of those ones that I uh, it's not eutrochium, it's not eupatorium, is it eutrochium? No, eutrochium is jopiweeds. Eupatorium? No, this is the one that I always forget. It's in that same group. They were all in the same genus uh, before, and it's very resistant to uh, grazing and a lot of different things, tolerant of lots of different light and uh, soil conditions, and so it, it self-seeds into spots where it can quite readily. Uh, Again, this area, I keep saying it's a work in progress. I used to have a lot more stuff in the center. Didn't really like how it was. So uh, me, before I move, I'll do a, a redo of this. I did throw some blanket flower seeds in here. So it'll hopefully get more of that action going on. Uh, these are chrysanthemum ar ar arctium. Chrysanthemum, it's common name is Arctic Daisy. Uh, not an easy plant to find. I'm very happy that I have these. Another very late bloomer. Uh, it's related to, it's the, the only North American native chrysanthemum, and so I like that about it. And it takes a lot of abuse, it takes a lot of heat, a lot of dryness, surprisingly, and so I really like that. Uh, we have some floppy smooth aster here that is just uh, flopped completely over. This uh, hardy plumbago is still going. It basically starts in like late June, July, and then it just keeps on going. Uh, this is this is what I really like in the fall is the asters. So I let a lot of them, they just sort of seed in from around. I have moved a couple of them, you know, I planted a couple of them. 
But uh, you, if you look at the stem here, you can see that for the most part, this has only just started to bloom. So this is one of those uh, plants that will just 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 kicking off now, which is kind of kind of weird to think about. Because if you look right next door, this common milkweed, uh, Asclepias syriaca, is just completely done. So all the leaves are falling off. You know, it's like in full fall mode, which things should be because it's October. So uh, I can go over here and take a quick look at some of the. This is a bed that I threw together back in June. So made with uh, just compost, yard waste from everybody's uh, tra basically trash around the block. It's just grass clippings and all that good stuff. And then some compost from back in uh, my compost bin. And I just sort of threw a couple of, couple of things in here hoping I'd get, get somewhere with them. And we actually have, kind of. Uh, so this ground cherry did not do very well here. I think it's maybe too shady or the soil chemistry might be a little bit off. This uh, over here, this is a I think honeycomb hybrid tomato. And again, I planted this bed really late, so some of these things are just starting to yield now, which is unfortunate. But you know, if I'm still around next year, uh, I'll be able to plant at a more appropriate time and get higher yields. So this tomato is doing fine. It's a good amount of shade. The cage was to keep the deer away from when it uh, originally was going. You can see parts that are sticking out of deer have deer graze damage, some more obvious than others. So that's been doing well. This uh, over here, here's just some, some flake soil I have percolating. Uh, this is a lychee tomato. Uh, I can't remember what the species name is for it, but I think maybe it's Solanum lychee or something like that. And it's doing really well here. Again, started it late. It seems to, the fruits seem to ripen at a slower pace than traditional horticultural tomatoes. It does have all these really cool thorns here uh, all over. And these, this looks like this stem was damaged and it's forcing the fruit to ripen. I'm not sure if I want to eat those, but I'll probably use them to save seed for next year. And this is Biden's Alba. This is a more southern uh, species of, of Biden's. This is actually from burrs that I picked off my socks from Key Largo or from Homestead, Florida. So this is what Euphoria sepulchralis was eating in the wild was, oh, and I, I forgot I have some peas snuck through here. Actually, that was good to go. So again, very low effort in here. I just wanted to get something growing in this bed so it didn't have to sit all, all summer and just look like mulch. Yeah, so there's lots of pollen on there. Uh, there was a bee fly on one of these a second ago. I don't know where it went to. But unfortunately, at this latitude, it uh, it only seems to want to bloom in short days. So it uh, just started blooming. So this will give some, just a little bit of something, something to look at over here. It'll be popular with pollinators on a, on a warm, late, uh, late fall, early winter day. Uh, just some dill, dill that has been decimated by black swallowtail uh, caterpillars. I planted this on August 1st, so I, I'm, I'll probably do a little tiny, i get a little tiny harvest before frost. This lettuce is obviously very behind as well. But I also don't water this bed at all. This is all just water with rain and whatnot. And moving on over here, a couple asters over there. Those get hit pretty hard by, dill, uh, by uh, deer. Uh, seed heads from Lactucca floridensis, the uh, that uh, Michigan State uh, threatened species of lettuce. It's been really, really, really dry. Like we we've had a weird summer where we'll go like, uh, I guess a weird fall now where we'll go weeks without rain, and then we'll just get a couple of days of of pretty good rain and things will perk back up, back up, and then it'll just be dry again. It's been absolutely awful. You can see this is a hardy. Uh, blue mist flower i think genus is conoclinum it's uh often sold as a uh, bedding plant the the uh, not cold hardy one this is a cold hardy one and it's not very happy with all the, the dryness uh, some of these things are are completely unbothered like the lettuce which has a nice tap root uh, you can see we're at the dead end dead end of my season's garden here i think i brought that up before where it starts with a hepatica and goes on to a phlox and then some sort of wood mint, skull cap, uh, anise, 
anise scented goldenrod and then we end up at the end of the bloom season here with this uh, woods blue aster uh, symphiotrichum oblongifolium i think and this thing you can see there's part of the plant that started to bloom but look this this section here hasn't even started so uh, within the next two to four weeks it'll start blooming and if we have warm nights uh, the main pollinators will be bumblebees on it during the day which always brings me joy to see bumblebees in October and uh, at night though there's a lot of moths that nectar from a lot of the asters and the uh, elephant mosquitoes too that, that drink uh, nectar instead of uh, drinking blood also if anybody said anything in the chat I have live chat visible I don't think anybody said anything uh, so that's that's good I guess another aster symphiotype and plosa you can see the seed heads on the uh, eutrochium purpurea purpurium there the uh, sweet joe pie and then just kind of look at what's going on over here in the little bed for my neighbor the foam flower tiarella is almost completely dormant or grazed or whatever uh, as it tends to get doesn't really like the spot that much geraniums are all in, in wreckage shape. Some of the stuff by the curb is doing fine. Like there's some wet yarrow, the more of this hairy aster here. Uh, violets look good. It's probably gonna be a good year for violets next year when these all bloom. A lot of those are transplanted early this year. And so there's some, there's some there's blue stem goldenrod. The, the dryness is just a blue stem. And then there's uh, zigzag. This is zigzag, uh, Salo, Saladago, Plexicollis, and this is Saladego, uh, not Morales, uh, Acacia, a blue stem gold. And you can see both of them, just they're, they're so done with the, with the dryness, they're just completely done. So, uh, so the next thing to bloom in this bed, after all these asters sort of wrap up their act, uh, there's a, I think it's a heath aster in there, doesn't really like this spot. So it's not doing all that well. Uh, but the next thing to bloom in here after the asters are all done, I guess after the blue mist flower is done, will be the hepatica all the way in March. So that's the next time there's going to be there's going to be flowering going on in here, unless something you know happens weird and out of season. Uh, you can see the spring woodland bed here. A lot of stuff is has long gone dormant. Uh, sedges have set their seed and have already put out their vegetative foliage and the non-reproductive stems and stuff uh this is a pretty nifty plant there's supposed to be more of this in here but you know obviously things do what they want to uh this is white doll's eyes this is actia pachypoda and so this is a, a winter interest plant oh my little my little uh, stacking of logs here you can see some active mycelium growing there i colonize these with uh pink oyster mushrooms and uh, pink oyster is a tropical species, so it, it died over the winter, which is fine. That's why I wanted to. I just wanted to get at least one flush of, uh, of mushrooms out of it. Here's my fake mushrooms again. Uh, this goat through is also just completely done. Moon seeds starting to go dormant. This, uh, this threatened species of uh, Eupatorium bone set is obviously setting a lot of seeds. This is a good year for it. It doesn't seem to mind the dry soil, but it is a species of species from dry oak forest. So this is the perfect habitat for it over, over here. Uh, let's see anything else. Some honeysuckle I'll probably cut in the winter to use for bug food. A couple of things over here. We have uh, Hydrotelephium telephioides. This is the native allegheny stone crop. I actually have, you can see the cultivar this is the one the other the uh cultivated varieties i think it's autumn fire autumn joy getting eaten by the dogwoods probably take that out next year or just you know transplant it over i kind of like this lighter pink color more anyways so this is uh this is a nifty one that obviously doesn't really care that we have we've had so much dryness it did kind of Stone crops are kind of hit or miss with whether or not deer eat them. There are a couple of springs where they've come over here and they've eaten pieces off of this. There's a couple of people with some stone crops by the by the road up and down the street. And some of them, you know, there's a bit of grazing on hers over there. And 
one of the one of the neighbors it just they the deer ate it to the ground it might be a variety thing might be a it just tasted very pretty at that time or something there There's sign ob obligatory sign showing uh let's see what else we are getting closer to some of the other cooler stuff here some more of the uh hydro and telephioides this maybe wouldn't be such a, a bad option to put into some of those other spots over there i was looking at but again that's a that's an next year thing we are we are beyond we are beyond the outdoor yard work for the year i will not i will not do anything else out here other than you know put my cushions away uh taking some little uh, ornaments and decorative stuff like my rain rain gauge and stuff from out here but other than that it is smooth sailing until next february or march little harebell still blooming there it's uh very underrated they basically start blooming it's an it's a native it, it's a uh, native to the entire northern hemisphere and basically once it starts blooming it just doesn't really stop it's not necessarily a heavy bloomer though i mean i guess you kind of see a lot more flowers on it in uh may and june and then it uh it just sort of sporadically over the rest of the growing season will throw up flowers so that's pretty nifty a uh, very gated obedient plant is already th with the dryness you can see this common bone set here is just done also most years these are both still vigorous and lush plants right now but because of the the dryness they are they're they're really really fighting they're really straggling here so moving over to here we have a little bit more of that woods blue aster again that i just i just love it that it's it's about to bloom it hasn't already bloomed it's about to bloom so there'll be some pops of color here all the way until frost and a little beyond uh euthamia is going to seed uh nine bark still looks pretty happy despite the time of year uh, looking out over to here, sunflowers are going to seed. Uh, we'll go and look at some of these asters over there too. So we look at this really quick here. This is this is my little drinking pond pool for stuff. And, and let's see. Yeah, it's still got mosquito fish in it. That's good. Uh, so yeah, I I put mosquito fish in here to eat the mosquitoes. It also has the uh, has the dunk pellets too. And you can see that moss is really moss is really happy. Moss, cool temperature. Uh, it'll take a lot of light. Cool temperature, lots of water, lots of. How often do you drink from it? Uh, I don't. I don't uh, at all. Let's rest in peace. Are you still alive, buddy? Rest in peace. It happens. Probably laid eggs in here actually. Anyways, but this the little special plant in here. I don't know if I pointed out before. Is this dwarf horsetail? Uh, I got my mosquito fish on just from some random eBay seller, actually. I, uh, I try to maintain a little group of them over the winter. And no, the mosquito fish will not, uh, will not overwinter here. Do we have something slide in? Yes, we did. Probably a cat or deer tried to drink from here. This is a weedy native polygonatum. Uh, I really like seeing it because the, the seed heads bring me lots of joy and I wish there'd be more of it, but it, it wants moisture soil and it wants to not be eaten by deer. We got another piece falling here? Yep. Yep. There we go. All right. So yeah, this is dwarf horsetail. I uh, got it at a local nursery. Uh, it, it was in a corner here. Maybe you guys remember it from the first stream. Uh, now it's, uh, it's in the, this little pot in the center. Uh, yeah, this has got a couple of little, not really sure what, what the technical term is for them, not really runners, but it's got little sections that have crawled out uh, from, from here. I definitely need to take some of this with me when I eventually move because it's a, it's a neat little, and it gets more vigorous looking than this, but I, I put the moss in here because I really like the moss. There'll be more of it as it cools off and when there's actually snow. I, I'd say if there's no snow on the ground, the best time of the year in Michigan for moss is from uh, December through to March because if there's days where it's above freezing you know it thaws out and then it's it's actually actively growing and photosynthesizing when there's not all these vascular plants competing with it so yeah if you're going looking for mosses in like the midwest snow free days from December through March are the best here we have this is a this is a decision I don't know if I thought through too well this is symphiotrichum is that a blonde folium? Maybe I was wrong about the other one. Uh, I need to 
I need to refresh my, my Aster knowledge. Uh, this is common name, for some reason I can remember the common name, uh, is uh, aromatic aster because the leaves are mildly aromatic. It is also very, very, very late blooming. It is a plant of dry, scorching, uh, scorching, dry, full sun areas. And I have it here in debatably part sun. Uh, I wanted it mainly for the deer resistance and for the late blooming. And you know what? Even if it's all flopped through here, you know, it looks, it's fine. It's bringing lots of color. There's a lot of bees on it. Uh, the other plant that's intermingled here with it is the, there's some echinacea. Can you wipe off the lens, bro? Yes, I can. <laughs> Sorry, you guys had to see that. Uh, might also be the, might also be the quality of the stream. Uh, let me know if that did any, if that improved it. But anyways, there's, um, the echinaceas, skull caps. Uh, you guys may remember that from the midsummer one, the skull cap through here. Yeah, it might be, I'm outside, it might be uh, transmitting it. The quality sometimes drops when the connection drops. So uh, we'll just have to, we'll just have to deal with it for the moment. But anyways, so this is an intermingling of, there's some um, Plains Oval Sedge, there's Skull Caps, there's American Germander. There's a lot of stuff intermingled with this to just make it a gigantic ground cover. And also the strawberries. Most of these strawberries I did not plant. Those have all moved around on their own. I think they were mostly over there when I first when I first cleared this area. And now you can just see it's a carpet of them throughout all of here, which is great in the, the, the summer. It's great to go strawberry picking here. Even though they're smaller, they have more taste than the uh, store-bought ones. So a lot of that, and again, no watering or anything like that. Let's see if we can get a good angle from out here. Uh, dogwood bushes that I've cut down are basically deer feeders now, because all the tender parts are at ground level where they like to graze. So that's all mixed through here. I will probably this winter clear out the rest of these and sell the twigs for, you know, people use them for arts and crafts and things like that. Uh, but of course they have to lose their leaves first. And then, tough stuff down by the road we've looked at before actually we'll get a good good angle on this over here so there's some harebells down here there's a lot of gylardia i there's one day where i came home where i came out here and i realized somebody had run up over the curve and so there's a big uh, ditch of a, a tire track mark along the, the curb here and I was like, all right, I need to fix this. So I went and got some Gylardia seeds, either from my garden or from the ones that I put at my neighbor Joe's down the street. And I seeded them all in here. And I think it's a year and a half later, they've all really taken and will probably never go away, which is great. It's also some black eyed Susans. Any of these open areas were areas where there were, there were dogwoods shading them out uh, last year. And obviously I cut them back this year. So, uh, so now, next next uh, next year there'll be a lot of annuals popping up in here. There'll be partridge pea, black-eyed Susan, the Gylardia, uh, some of this Budalua, Curtipendula might end up popping up. Some some neem lavender through here. Uh, all the opuntias are going flat for the winter too. Got a little bit of plains coreops is still going in here. Oh, I did I forgot about these. I did put some uh, edible culinary marigolds. I just tucked them in here. I had extras and I didn't really know what to do with them. So I guess that they survived. They did that all the way back on the 4th of July. And you can see a little bit more of the coreopsis over there. Usually there's more of it this late in the year. Trash. Usually there's more of it. See, here's a harebells that's pretty much in full bloom here, even though it's October. So again, I don't don't really understand when it when it wants to bloom and when it doesn't uh the ground cover and the ground through here is very grassy and again some of this stuff i brought up before in the past streams oh you can hear it's uh, alanemobius or neonemobius over there uh over here this is actually all nodding wild onion from seed that i put in over here it's very deer resistant here's a flower head so a lot of these next year should flower and they just sort of you know they fill in the holes and the niches so there's you know a lot of invasive stuff that can that can compete in here when there's such a dense planting this is solanum carolinense carolina horse nettle 
uh, very weedy, very good plant ecologically for lots of bugs and for native wildlife. This was started from a single plant that was like this size. And this year, moving the, cutting out the dogwoods just gave it the sunlight it needed to expand. And so it's popped up in quite a few places. I don't anticipate it to become very dominant in here. It'll probably just fill holes wherever it can. A little bit of Renarda punctata uh, holding out from a couple of years ago when it was it was very prominent in this area, and then it was uh, it was uh, pushed out by a lot of the stuff, the other stuff that you're seeing in through here. All right, this is a, this is a really good one. Uh, it's it's about at the end of the middle of the bloom, if that makes any sense. But this is Salvia azuria. It's a prairie sage, and it's beautiful. Just look at that. And it would actually be less floppy. We may go over uh, really quick to my neighbor Karen's and look at the ones I put in over there. But uh, again, this is surprisingly, after a certain point, this becomes more shady than it does sun during the year because you got the trees blocking in the spring, you know, it's full sun. The oaks and the elms leaf out. And then right around the beginning of August is when, you know, the sun really notably starts to be more southern setting. And so this ends up being a lot shadier than you would anticipate. So uh, yeah, just probably, probably one of my favorite favorite plants. And it's intermingled with all this other stuff because otherwise it would be very floppy. You can see there's more of it there. It's more of the Plains Coreopsis. I want to say this is subspecies speciosa because it's got deeper blue flowers than this other one. I got a bunch of plugs of this a couple of, uh, maybe it was last year or the year before. Uh, but anyways, yeah, a very beautiful, beautiful native plant. Um, all right, continuing onwards is Penstemon. I think a groundhog ate all the seed heads off of it, but very nice fall color on the foliage. Uh, Gastiche funiculum just wrapping up. You know, there's still bees going to it, as you can see. Uh, the other prairie sage, Artemisia ludoviciana. Uh, this is the, I think these might be the seeds. Uh, again, the flowers are not too distinguishable from the seeds at a quick glance on this because it's not a true sage. It's in the uh, mugwort family. And then here's, here's what I was really hoping to get to. This uh, Symphiotrichum species, probably Pelosa or some, some, something very similar to it. Uh, but this is, this is what, what really brings some character to this space during the fall. You get this lovely bloom of these little daisy-like flowers. And of course, lots of bees on them, both honeybees and bumblebees. You know, I, I'd imagine their honeybees are basically anything that's still kicking this time of year is not going to be particularly picky about what it's going to be taking nectar and pollen from. So we got a lot of those. This is uh, maybe Symphiotrichum levi or Ulantigenensi. Uh, I can't remember which species it is. And obviously not, not quite as happy as this, uh, this native, uh, this, well, local genotype pelosum, which is, uh, I think you, you see, here's the other thing is the problem with the asters, especially here, <clears throat> is you can see how concurrent the bloom time is. You can see how many of them there are here is that some of these are, are most likely hybrids with other ones from here around here. Like you can see the habit on this the flowers are very similar but then the foliage is a little bit different on this one here uh, with the sparsest and whatnot so some of these it's just they throw my hands up and it's just okay it's a symphiotrichum of some sort so here's another one hiding over in here and you can also see here's the partridge pea patch uh, completely has lost all of its leaves most of the the seeds have popped so this area here Let's see if we can look at the ground and if it'll actually show up on the... Yeah, you can probably make out. Might be able to make out, there's so many seeds and stuff here, how complex the ground looks. And this is, you know, this is really... Our ...wildlife over the winter with all the, the, the seeds the partridge peas produce. Uh, I've seen a couple of times, and I haven't caught them this year. I have caught them in years past, but couple times I'll be in the office and I'll see a big flock of morning doves that'll be re resting on the power lines over there 
and I'm pretty sure that's from, you know, something spooks them and they fly up out of the good foraging habitat here and they fly up over there and they, you know, come back. I haven't caught them in the act, you know, I haven't come outside and caught the whole flock of them over here, but, you know, I'm pretty sure that's what's going on. Uh, we got this big old pasture thistle who is also done. So I think it was, was it August? In, I can't remember if the last time we were out here, if it was actually blooming or if it was getting ready to bloom, but uh, it's one of those late summer, really late summer, early fall uh, bloomers. I look forward to it because it's always got swallowtails and goldfinches on it. But yep, there's the carcass. It's a, it's a biennial, so it's it's gone, gone for, for good. But there's been a lot of, I noticed this last year, there's been a lot of little rosettes from them popping up from seeding in through here. Uh, so they'll, they'll, there's more, there's, in fact, there's one right over there. You can see that. That leaf right there is uh, from a pasture thistle, so there'll be more next year. Here's this Monarda bradburiana. This stuff right here looks like it doesn't even know what time of year it is. Like, look how green, how lush and intact all the foliage is. It's actually very nice. <coughs> more Plains coreopsis on the edge there. Again, uh, I, I guess there's there's a good amount of it still going. That that's another one that will go until until frost. That's nice. Here's calico aster this must have blown in from somewhere here's calico aster you can see how it's got that sort of pinkish purplish tinge to all the parts it's uh i think you usually associate this with woodland edges this here is the uh oh we almost stuck on this liatris that's going to bloom here this here is the uh skeleton of, I guess it's still going, of a butternut squash that I planted out here to see if I could get a reasonable harvest without uh, any inputs. So I'm going to, I'm going to set the phone down for a second and grab this bad boy. There we go. Okay. So, uh, no water, no fertilizer, no nothing. I was just going to see if I could if it was possible to uh, work doing some agriculture, some stricter ag agricultural crop things into this uh, native planting here, and it worked. I got this out of it, no inputs, just, you know, whatever, water, etc. cetera, uh, received from rainfall. And again, it was a crappy year for water. But this isn't the only one. There's another one that ripened before it that I already took inside. So no inputs. Oh, there's a big carpenter bee over there at the, the salvia. No inputs, and I got this nice butternut squash out of it, so I'm happy with that. Here's some more uh, Symphiotrichum. I think, again, I think it's Pelosa. Pelosa. Uh, yeah, just, just bopping. And it, again, at night, you know, the day crew's on it right now. It's all Bombus and Patience and the uh, uh, whatever the subspecies and species is for the domestic honeybees, whoever they're calling them now. Uh, but at night, there'll be quite a few different moths on this, especially now that in, in this time of year, all the way up to frost. I, I really, I, I just find that so cool that like, you know, maybe this flower from a, from an ecological standpoint, the pollinator is not actually meant to be, you know, all these flies and bees and whatnot that are on it. It might actually be meant to be the moths because they are, they're usually quite abundant at night. There's, there's where I planted the squash last year. Um, but yeah, again, I love, my favorite thing I think about this time of year, here's a Melanopolis uh, femur rubrum or Gricio, can't remember what the other one is, femur rubrum, the other one that looks almost exactly like it right here. Uh, if you look at the ground, you can just see how complex it is. Strawberries, uh, there's violets, there's all kinds of different plants there, you know, things for stuff to graze on in the middle of winter and to hide in, you know, all kinds of habitat for all kinds of things. This, uh, this showy goldenrod is nearing the end of its run. I was hoping that I would be able to get it in the, in its prime, but you know, it's, it's just, it is what it is. Instead we get the nice asters. Look at, look at this shot. I'm just going to pause on this for a second. Look at that. I love the mixture of the the browns, the greens, the whites, the purple. It really, 
he really sort of anchors you in a very specific time and place. You know, sometimes in the summertime when you, or even with native plantings, you're like, is it June, is it July? But it's like, if you're, you're seeing asters blooming, you, you can be pretty sure that, that it's fall wherever you are. Anyways, yeah, so this Soldego speciosa, it's on its way out. You know, there's, there's still some, there's some flowers blooming on each of these. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the technical term for this. Not a flower spike, it's like a wand or something like that. Anyways, but on, on each of these, um, each of these reproductive stems, I guess, there we go. You can see uh, there's, there's still there are a couple of bumblebees over there still working them. So uh, Diablo, Nine Bark Diablo, one of my favorite plants. I will definitely be reserving some space for these at the, the future place I move to because I just love this plant so much. Uh, but all of this growth, that's about, oh, yeah, looks like I've got mail. That's about six feet there. It's almost in six, a little bit over six foot two um, flex because I'm six foot two. Uh, so this is like six foot four, six foot five. That is all this year's growth. I cut all my nine barks to the ground to sort of rejuvenate them or to sort of refresh the habit this spring. And I was, I always get concerned when I do that with woody stuff because it's like, is it gonna grow back? Uh, and of course it did. Oh, I guess it's not a box for me, it's for my neighbor. Anyways, um, so here's this bed, Soldego altissima or canadensis or something or other coming out of bloom as well. A couple of asters uh, intermingled through here. Next year, again, if I'm, if I'm still around, I probably will be in the spring to, have, to take care of this, but I think my approach for here is gonna be uh, it has been becoming more and more goldenrod over the years, which is fine for maintenance, but I do kind of miss the mixture of other things that would pop up and intermingle through here. And so I will probably, excuse me, I will probably go through here and uh, cut all of the, anything in the genus Solidago that's in here, cut it to the ground in uh, May and maybe do that even into June, just to sort of, you know, give a, a little bit of uh, selective advantage to all the stuff that isn't that and see, you know, how things shift doing that. Because the seed bank in here is, is insane because this is the oldest part of the whole planting. So it's, it's got all kinds of seeds established in here. So who knows what could pop up. I mean, every year I'm, I always forget that. You can see the one stem there, there's more of it further through it. I always forget that there's Indian grass in here. It's a sorgastrum uh, Newton's Nuttons. Uh, Drew used to abbreviate on his uh, list as Sore Nut. Uh, first three letters of every Latin name was the abbreviation, so that ended up being the Sore Nut. But I always forget that that's in here. I always forget that there's big blue stem, that there's little blue stem, that there's switch grass, because they just, you know, they're, they're tucked in everything and you don't even really notice them until they send up their seed heads. We have uh, Virgin's Bower, Clematis Virginiana uh, going to seed. This, this is the seed right here. Yeah. Oh, there we go. So you got clematis going to see again. This isn't uh, this isn't the invasive uh, uh, sweet autumn clematis. This is a slightly earlier bloom time, and obviously is native. It can still be. Uh, you, you can see in here this year, it really began to march places through uh, th through the planting. Here's some white snake root that already finished up flowering. Very weird, there's a lot of mixture of, uh, bl of bloom times on, on this plant. You can get a quick look through the side here. Oh, there looks like there's an aster blooming over there we could go look at. We have this area, the strawberry fields, which is looking a lot more burnt out. Uh, back. We had, uh, we were having even less water, which was until like 4th of July when it was like 90 all spring. And so this, this area, which was just completely dense with strawberries, kind of like the other areas that we looked at over there, uh, it was just, uh, almost bare ground in some spots. And then we eventually got rain and it rebounded. And if we got more rain, it would have rebounded more and covered more of this area in September, but it's getting a bit late. It'll start growing pretty early though. Here's a younger uh, showy goldenrod. This came from the plant that was over seeded in. Uh, it's got some sort of wasp on it and uh, bumblebee 
So sometimes first year plants are young. A little bit of tropical milk. And to just sort of give some color to this spot, which was historically difficult. The deer would you know, come right down the street or come across my neighbor's yard and then snack on the first green thing that they could find that wasn't grass. And so it's been kind of historically difficult to put something over here that does well. And so low maintenance, colorful, long bloom time, tropical milkweed it is. So I'll save some seed from that for the motorcyclist to disappear. Uh, anyways, see here's another hairy aster that hasn't even started blooming yet. So it's possible this thing will have blooms into mid-November even. They're pretty, they're pretty cold tolerant too. U Eutrochium uh, fistulosum. I need to grab some seeds from that. Okay. Try to go pie. Uh, whew. Seeds everywhere. Moving along over here. Uh, Helianthus divaricatus, woodland sunflower, has fully colonized this space. This prickly ash is doing really well too. Uh, this is Aurelia racemosa. Probably going to be gigantic when it comes back next year, which is what I wanted. The nice lush look over here. Uh, emergency food supply hostas along the side of the house. Those have been here basically since I moved in. I do nothing to take care of them. Um, yeah, here's, here's a couple of asters that have survived and made their way uh, through the, the bigger planting here. This planting is just... It, it's been a rough year for this planting with... Uh, when Victor was obsessed with the groundhog a couple of weeks ago, you know, he found a way to get in here to chase it and eventually got it. But uh, so it's had Victor running through it. We've had the drought, which has not been the best. It's, uh, I mean, plant, all, all these things are pretty drought tolerant, but still we are just, we just did not get enough water this year for, for business as usual. Uh, more of that endangered or threatened, um, threatened uh, bone set this is a cool this is a cool plant i always love seeing this is uh oh it's got some roaches in it actually and some earwigs but mostly earwigs this is echinocystis lobata also known as wild cucumber vine it produces these little loofah-esque uh seed seed uh, fruits here and some earwigs crawling out of it and another one uh, but yeah, it's basically a loofah in there, and they basically shoots the seeds out of here at, at high speed at the ground. Not exactly sure why they shoot it at the ground, uh, why they wouldn't eject it like in one direction or another one. But uh, anyway, so that's that crawling up here. This um, Dutchman's Pike did really well this year after being eaten by the deer year one, so it's going to come back and probably probably cover this fight fight with a clematis to cover the fence here that'll be really nice um yeah see some big blue stem also called turkey foot uh seeds here i think i'm gonna rely pretty heavily on this and a few other native grasses when i eventually have to manage pasture i think these are going to be these going to be the ticket to having some good low maintenance no input pasture in the future and asters too, because goats will eat asters. They don't really don't really much like grasses. They like forbs like this American burnweed here. Uh, this is this is this is a native weed in the strictest sense, but it's a great plant for bees and of uh, both honeybees and bumblebees. So just let it, you know, let it go. The deer will eat it too. They'll come in and snip it back and it won't really care. Um all right. So I guess what we'll do now is we'll go look at my neighbor Karen's planting and just do a quick, you know, quick look, see, see what's up over there. Again, I just love, I love the complexity of the ground at the end of the growing season with all the seeds and the rosettes and the mixture of all kinds of weird different colors and mosses. I get, when I moved in, there were more mosses here, but it was, you know, it was managed as lawn. So there's not, there's not really much in the way of browned mosses here. Uh, so that's why I like having this here. But, you know, maybe another thing is some of them may not have had a chance to move in here. Uh, there's some more ferny looking mosses that uh, might, might do better in this sort of situation that may not have had the chance to have their spores blow in. 
So yeah, we'll go take a visit to uh, Karen's planting. There's one very, very special plant that I want to talk about over here. So that's uh, that's basically why I feel like it's worth the trip over because it's uh, it's it's a power performer in the fall. I just absolutely love this plant. All right, we disconnected for just a second. All right, we're on the LTE. Anyways, uh, snow on the mountain here. Hopefully that shows it off pretty good. Uh, we're gonna have a driver come by in a second. Uh, snow on the mountain. Uh, good, good plant for this historically difficult spot right here. So I'm gonna make sure lots of seeds get dropped into this this area here it's mostly rock underneath whatever topsoil has sort of come in so i gotta make sure there's some good plants here next year in fact i told karen we, we've been working on soil building in this bed for two and a half years because it was all dry sand and rock and stuff and we you know, pick plants that are good for that but you, you gotta get some you gotta get some organic matter build up but so next um next spring i think to get another flush of annual plants in some of the holes in here which have a little bit of leaf litter building up but it's not quite breaking down into uh it's not quite breaking down into soil i think this whole planting we're gonna rake and throw the organic matter in the vegetable garden that she's uh she's uh, making in the backyard and you know that's a good efficient use of the the organic matter that we've generated over the years you know all the all the minerals that have been pulled out of the soil it's not like there's just going to go off to a landfill or composting and get sold to somebody else it's you know she'll be making use of them uh, but i think we want some more things like the plains coreopsis which was very heavy in here the first year we really want that to come back and it's having a hard time with so much competition. Partridge pea, there'll be more of it over in that open area. I gotta go throw some seeds over there, as a matter of fact. Uh, anyways, let's look, here's, here you go. Aster pelosis, Symphiotrichum pelosis. Uh, right here, again, looking looking real nice. And this is the special plant that we came all the way here. Ooh, but really quick, before I get to that, last year, there was a uh, gar gora gora lindheimeri or coccinia which is uh, also called windflower or butterfly flower it's a biennial and it's you know it's mostly west and more plainsy than michigan and it came with the prairie moon seed mix that we put into here and i thought boy we really nice if that seeded in and we got some of that going on in here because it, it was another one with a late bloom period you know into september and well you know here's here's some basil rosettes and i don't think that they're from the primroses which there's a lot more of in here and are actually uh, the, the, those come from seeds that are late in the soil here you know going back how many dozens or, or hundreds of years uh but anyways I, the, these leaves do not look like um you know, it's clearly a primrose family rosette, but these don't look like the uh, bi or bianus or the common evening primroses. So I'm pretty sure these are all butterfly flowers, which is great. Uh, little blue stem. It's a very friendly plant to see in the middle of the winter. The, these, uh, all the leaves will turn sort of a nice orange tan. Uh, always makes me happy. Joe has, Joe has or had quite a bit of it in his front yard now uh, the ecology is changing i don't see as much of it or the, the individual plants are not thriving so but in the winter his first year it really thrived in his planting and so it was uh it was great to go outside and in the middle of the winter go to visit him and see all the the little blue stems that were you know it, it brings some color and interest in the winter which is also i will say this now uh to any gardeners out there and then we're going to look at something cool over there uh <laughs> Do not do your cleanup until spring. If you do cleanup at all, don't do it until spring because this is a gigantic patch of habitat for all kinds of things to forage through during the winter. All kinds of birds will come through here and eat the seeds, the seeds off of things. All kinds of small mammals, voles and shrews and whatnot, chipmunks, uh, all kinds of larger animals. 
Uh, I will give an example of the value that leaving this standing over the winter does, one that I, that I was not aware of at all uh and and was it's it's cool to be able to share the information with you guys now focus on the astros while i talk so it was we had a bad winter two years ago you know either it was a lot of heavy snow or something like that it was before my yard was fenced off from the deer and of course i didn't care if the deer came through the wind during the winter time to eat the dead the dead stalks off of stuff who cares you know it's not going to affect the plant um but so the deer were clearly getting low on on brushy food so they don't you know people put out corn and stuff for them and all that stuff but they don't they need more than that you know they'll have health issues and complications with their gut bacteria if they're just eating that so they have to take in a lot of you know high fiber material too and so on this this harsh day there was a lot of snow on the ground so they couldn't you know forage at ground level but the deer came through and they ate the i'm gonna look at there's a patch of it over there it's the darkest green thing they were eating the dead, the dead brown dry leaves off of the goldenrod, which is something they, they almost never touch when it's green and during the growing season. They almost never touch goldenrods. And they were eating it, and they were eating it voraciously. And it's like, you know, getting that, getting that fiber is, um, is is important for them during the winter time maybe you know they could have lost one of them or something during the winter if they hadn't had that opportunity or whatever not, not like we need any more deer but you know it's they're, they're making use of of that sort of stuff oh here we go but a lot of things to talk about here here's a chinese man to oof i'm just gonna pick that and pocket it and be reasonable or unreasonable with it later um anyway so here's here's something really cool Here's some Oncopeltis phasiatus, some uh, lar uh, large milkweed bugs feeding on this butterfly weed here. And I think it's one of their preferred things to eat over common milkweed in, in Michigan, or at least when both are available. And I like to call butterfly weed, maybe somebody will steal this from me. If somebody else has said this before and I'm, and I'm accidentally converging on the same, same sentiments, let me know. But I say that butterfly weed is the plant that's so nice it blooms twice because you get the bright orange flowers on it in the early summer. And then in the fall, you get the large milkweed bugs, you know, basically, you know, bringing that orange color back even though the plant has gone to seed. So it's one of my favorite things about butterfly weed is seeing the large milkweed bugs. And they will actually migrate down these little insects. Um... These little insects that are maybe like three quarters of an inch will migrate all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico area. So as soon as these guys are done developing, they're gonna and, and their their wings are hard once they're mature, they're they're flying straight down. They're, there's they do not overwinter in Michigan. We have plenty of members of this family that do overwinter in Michigan, but Oncopeltis phasiatus, these will be flying all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico where they can actually overwinter into Florida and whatnot. So I have read and so I have been told. So uh, they make, you know, per body size, that's that's actually more of an impressive journey than monarchs actually undergo because monarchs obviously go all the way down to Mex Central America and Mexico, uh, but they're much larger and their bodies are, their wings are much more capable of long distance flight. But these little, these little insects, these guys will be flying all the way down there. So, uh, yeah, so the goldenrod's already done, unfortunately. I'm really hoping there'd be more goldenrods to show. Here's some Monarda punctata that's just still going a little bit. It's another one that just doesn't really stop sometimes if it's happy. Uh, so this is tall goldenrod with a Ligeus tersicus. This is the false sunflower bug. Uh, instead of the, over there was the uh, large milkweed bugs, this uh, Ligeus tersicus. This will overwinter as adults, and they just overwinter in the leaf litter around here. All the yarrow, also completely done, has been done since like June. Uh, more showy milkweed has been done uh, since um, a couple, maybe a week ago. And then here's, uh, over here in my, my neighbor's yard where it's drier, and that's almost certainly why this stopped flowering. Here's more of that, uh, salvia azuria the prairie sage and it's all all done you know that the dryness and the extra sun here really forced it to just get its act over with 
And so, but you can see, instead of being floppy like mine is over in the shade there, this is fully standing upright, no floppiness or anything. So it's definitely a soil dryness and maybe a sun thing that causes it to be floppy or not so floppy. Anyways, special plant. This is Helianthus maximilianae. This is Maximilian, uh, Maximilian sunflower. And I just, I love this plant so much. Just again, late bloomer, but not just a late bloomer. You know, the asters, it's a bunch of little flowers. And of course it looks good as a whole plant from a distance, but this, look at this, this huge, huge flowers, abundantly covered in flowers. The ones that I have at my parents' house have maybe two to three times the number of flowers as this plant does because they're they're growing in better soil. Maybe not better lighting conditions because this is full sun pretty much, but uh, better better soil so the plant is producing more flowers. But still, again, this is another plant that this is still going to be blooming for several weeks now, even in October. And not just like a, not like a non-native plant would be blooming where there's not much ecological value. There's a lot of things that are going to be using this plant and have been. There was a little, um, one of those little uh, metallic, uh, I think, sweat bees on here. I should have showed it off before before I went and was talking about other things. But there's metallic sweat bees. There's uh, bumblebees going to it. There will be any butterflies, any butterflies that overwinter that are active on a warm day or, or butterflies with uh, complex life histories that may migrate or be partial migrate, etc. cetera. Uh, things like American ladies, red admirals, morning cloaks, etc. Any of those butterflies that are still out in park at this time of year will be coming to this to this plant uh, for the for the nectar and or pollen. It's it's wonderful. So if anybody out there, if you if you're looking for a very large, robust, drought tolerant native plant with an interesting bloom time, look into Helianthus maximilianae. It's perennial. I was very surprised this year the deer the last couple of years have really been hitting this plant hard and this year they barely touched anything in this planting for some reason don't know why some reason they didn't touch anything hardly in this planting so but look at that look at the the beautiful yellow against the nice the, the nice october sky there absolutely gorgeous nice and upright they will be floppier if it's in shade or if it's getting too much water etc but otherwise you know just a planet forget about it some of the sunflowers can be very assertive when you plant them things like that woodland sunflower by my uh by my air conditioner you probably saw it's been spreading around the air conditioner uh sun chokes which are uh, edible to humans uh sunflower helianthus tuberosus also people tend to complain about how assertive they can be the plant them. oh yeah the whole area was taken over by it, it took maybe two years and it was completely swallowed up uh, Helianthus maximilianae does not roam. It spreads out from the center of wherever you plant it. It does not, you know, you won't find one over there, one over there, one over there. It's, uh, it, it will spread out to form a clump, which is also a very nice horticultural uh, characteristic, you know, looking from a hort perspective. So, uh, so yeah, that's that. Well, I'm going to just take a quick stroll here. You can see uh, Karen mowed a couple areas here. We were kind of not so eye to eye on, I mean, she, she wanted to go a certain route with this, but you know, she saw the grass and figured she would mow it. You know, it's, it's fine. Next year, this is all getting turned into this sort of stuff. So it doesn't, doesn't really matter, but, uh, but you can see the mixture of the different Budalua species here. Budalua hirsutus, Budalua curtipendula, Budalua, what's the blue one? Uh, Gracilis. Hirsute, oh, Gracilis hirsutus and Crotopendula. So this is a matrix of perennial native drought tolerant grasses here. You can see the seeds here. Uh, hirsutus has a little spine at the end. Of, yeah, so this must be Hirsutus here. Has a little spine at the end uh, like that. And this must be Gracilis because it does not have the spine at the end of this. So a uh, mixture of them forms this nice dense matrix. You know, we can burn it. We can do all kinds of man. We can, we can run a head of, of guinea pigs of weakers on this if we wanted to, which we did last year to clear out the annual stuff. I went through and along the edge where Karen sometimes runs over with the, her, uh, her car accidentally, there was a lot of crabgrass. It's an annual, and of course, when she mowed through here, and it, you know, it's fine, it's fine. Um, when she mowed through here, the blades of the mower will hack away at the 
taller upright uh, Budaluas, but the crabgrass has a creeping habit and so the, the blades will just go right over it and not even chop the seed heads off. And so to fix that problem, I got the propane torch out and did a little mini uh, controlled burn through here. So that's why this whole area is uh, brown. Is If there's any native grasses in here, any of the Budaluas in here, which you can see there is a little bit of it in here, uh, those are perennial, so they'll be fine. And any of the crab grasses, like these ones that you, that even managed to re-sprout, uh, those are just going to die. They're not going to produce any seeds. So we've cut back the seed bank of the weeds in this space. And then, of course, I went through and threw a bunch of uh, of native seed in here, yarrow and and whatnot. And so this this area here, you guys can see it now. Uh, if all the seed that I'm supposed to get and all the stuff that I've already thrown in comes in, you're gonna watch the space transform from, you know, a burnt out semi wasteland. It's not really a wasteland, but you, the burn, controlled burn area, all the way over to beautiful meadow, prairie looking habitat in, in under a year, because it'll probably be, you know, mid July-ish next year when this really takes off. So you can, we will, we'll do a check-in, you know, whether or not I'm here I'll, I have to come and do maintenance on Karen's stuff, so we'll we'll be back and we'll be able to look into it. So you can see this uh, this prairie coreopsis not competing well. It's you know the, here's one on the edge of the more established perennial planting on on over there. So but yeah, so this you know, I don't care about some clovers. I don't care about some dandelions. Here's a here's a black eyed Susan rosette already over here. Uh, so I don't really care about those things. You know, they have some ecological value, but we had to get the crabgrass out of here. More black-eyed Susans. More of the uh, Brutalua here. Uh, more Aster over there. That actually might be a different species. Again, with all these species, same bloom time, so genetically close, and so physically close together, inevitably things are going to get mixed up. So you can see these almost look like a mixture between the Calico Aster and the, the Hairy Aster. Uh, so who knows? So yeah, again, all these, a lot of these, they all form hybrids, and in this sort of novel environment, they're only gonna, you know, the mix of mix of things is only gonna be more likely. So a couple of the uh, retibitas, they're still going. Uh, another one I put into fill in this. This is a difficult spot with a weird amount of leaf litter accumulating in the heat and the dryness, but you know, it's it's taking shape. I'm I'm quite content with it. A very confused partridge pea over here still has flowers on it. Very confused partridge pea. Uh, the black-eyed Susans. This this whole area would still have black-eyed Susans blooming if we didn't have a June that was in the 90s and no rain. We would still have black-eyed Susans blooming here if it was not 90 degrees for I think it was somewhere between 10 days and two weeks in June. It was it was awful and no rain. So. Again, this this whole area gets no water, so this is all whatever you know. It's picked for dry, tolerant plants, it's a mixture of seeds, whatever. But still, the black-eyed Susans would not have forced themselves to seed so early and you know died if it weren't for that that streak of weather that we had. So there would there would still be some scattered flowers here. So that's what it'll look like next year, hopefully, along the hillsides. The arrow, it's not a rough. Uh, so this is. This. All right, I think now I think we're back, we're back. Uh, I'll just wrap up some of the discussion here, some beds that I put in uh, this year that are gonna fill in and look really nice next year. Hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, the deer seem to have eaten the leaves off those obedient plants, but uh, yeah, so most of the stuff is deer resistant and whatnot. We've got a hibiscus bed over here. This is a bed more of Karen's design. Not exactly my taste with the little seed and ground covers and the uh, little uh, white furs, but uh, so yeah, this is this is a lot of things done on a budget. A lot of small plants started as little teeny tiny plugs uh, this year, so next year they should gain some size. Prairie rag, uh, prairie rag wart, uh, more of the aromatic aster, some uh, narrow leaved mountain mint. And a bunch of really smelly deer resistance things out here. Hibiscuses are, have been consistently deer resistant for us. So I got her a bunch of different really high caliber ornamental varieties. Like, look, look, look at this. Why are you still blooming? It's October. You know, first year plant in the ground. Look, it's getting ready to do a whole flush of growth on there. It's ridiculous. And look, here's another one here. 
anyways so this is gonna look look a lot better next year again a lot of the beds take a couple of years to establish like this one you know look really nice the annual bed up by the house uh which the heavy winds and the i guess just the seasonality those mexican torches are getting quite tired for the year and then this bed is kind of a dumpster fire because it was specced as a shade bed and then the guy took down the trees that were there and they planted more trees and so now all the stuff that was meant for heavy shade is now part sun or full sun. So, you know, it's a work in progress. You live and learn. Uh, but yeah, so that's, that's, the, that's the fall tour. And I didn't update the description for this because I, I, I think I might even do a winter one. Not like there's too much substantial that changes in the winter. But, you know, to, to get outside and just sort of show off the, the winter aesthetic, I think, would be kind of nifty, you know. So just, just without spoiling too much or saying anything, you know. So in the winter, stuff like this white yarrow is still going to be standing. So even with the snow, even with a, a couple of inches of snow around it, you have these, you know, this interest, something popping out of the snow that, that doesn't just make it look like a big, open, empty space. And and stuff like that. So just as one example, I just caught something over here. Oh, now these are, let me get it to focus. These are small milkweed bugs. This is an Alcapeltis phasiatus. This is uh, Ligeus calmii. So the different genus and different species. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen them feeding on on butterfly weed before which is very weird i usually see them on common milkweed but you can see they're a different shade than the oncopeltis babies are and these ones also don't migrate they will uh the adult they will mature hopefully before the frost comes and then the the adults will just overwinter in the leaf litter and just around here so all right thanks everybody for this special live stream I will see everybody in a couple of hours for the wrapping up the auction. R recall that tonight we are not uh, doing an, a regular general live stream. We are going to be wrapping up the auction with the stuff that's in uh, the office and some other odds and ends that I actually forgot about. You know how it is. You guys should know how it is after the auctions this weekend. So uh, may, may, your, may your gardens be bountiful and I'll see you all in a couple of hours.